Hi everyone, thanks a lot for coming. Um, today we have our squash hand pollination webinar and this is presented by Gabi Masik. Um, and she's gonna be uh, going through the uh, steps of what we do here at Heritage Farm to save our squash seed uh, and hand pollinate it all. So uh, I will turn it over to her. Uh, again, thanks a lot for coming. It's great to see uh, some of you folks returning this week or this month. Thanks Grant. Uh, we'll go ahead and get started just by briefly reviewing the mission of Seed Savers. Um, our mission is to save North America's diverse uh, but endangered garden heritage for future generations by building a network of people committed to collecting, conserving, and sharing heirloom seeds and plants, um, while also educating people about the value of genetic, cult genetic and cultural diversity. Um, one of the methods that we employ at Seed Savers that allows us to um, preserve this diverse array of genetic diversity is through hand pollination. Um, hand pollination allows us to maintain the traits of an individual variety of squash while growing more than one species at a time. Um, the squash that you're seeing on your screen right now is called Papago, and it's a variety that has green and, green and cream stripes. Um, in order to maintain these characteristics of the plants, um, more specifically, the female flowers have to be isolated from the pollen of other varieties within the same species. Um, insects can carry the pollen of squash um, over a mile, uh, so isolating by distance can be really difficult unless you live in an area where either your neighbors aren't gardening um, or you're, you can be isolated in the country from other garden farmers. Um, so hand pollination allows us to grow varieties close together, but still prevent cross-pollination. Um, as gardeners, it's pretty important to have a basic understanding of pl plant taxonomy. Um, so we'll, we'll go through this real quick. I'm not sure how familiar everyone is, but uh, we'll have a quick overview. Um, on the screen now is the classification system for a squash variety that's offered in our catalog, the Yugoslavian finger fruit. The hier hierarchical structure probably looks familiar to you. Um, it's the Linnaean classification system. Um, this system classifies and categorizes plants into groups with similar characteristics, and then breaks those groups into smaller, more specific categories, on and on until a single species remains. Um, as relatively new seed savers, it isn't too important that you understand the whole system, as we're only going to talk about the last three classifications, the family, genus, and species. Um, gardeners should know the families of their garden plants for crop rotation and general growing guidelines. Um, squash belong to the Cucurbitaceae family, <laughs> which is a bit of a mouthful, um, and are often referred to the cucurbits. And included in this group are also melons, watermelons, and cucumbers. At Heritage Farm, our cucurbits are started in the greenhouse week 19 and week 20. Um, and if you're not familiar with the system of counting the calendar year in weeks, I would highly recommend um, looking into it. It's a system of using the weeks to delineate um, time within the year. Uh, these numbers can generally be found on a grower's calendar, and it really aids in consistency with planning throughout your season. Um, so our plants are started in the greenhouse and then transplanted to the field week 21 or 22. Um, upon going into the ground, they're immediately covered with reme, which is a light protective fabric that's suspended above the plants by wire hoops. Um, this allows our plants to grow in the field without the stress of insect pests until they reach a size um, where light feeding will not be detrimental to the overall health of the plant. Um, and at that point, the reme is removed and we begin um, just monitoring the plants for pest populations. But, um, but you know, so the knowledge of the plant families is useful. Um, seed savers can really get by only if they know the plant's genus and species. Um, this is pretty easy to find out because most of the seed packets will have this listed um, on them. Oh, shoot. <laughs> Sorry, I'm having technical difficulties. <laughs> um, a plant's genus and species make up that plant's binomial name which is sometimes called the Latin name. Um, the binomial name for the squash that's exhibited on the screen is Cucurbita pepo. 
Um, squash is an interesting craft type because different varieties that we often lump together under the term squash actually belong to different species. Um, and kind of going with that statement is that cross-pollination can only happen between plants of the same species. Uh, the four species of cucurbits we're going to focus on for this discussion are Pepo, Maxima, Argyrosperma, and Machata. Um, given that crossing will not happen between species, this means you could grow one variety within each of these four species in your garden and be able to save seed without worry. Um, Um, this squash sea pepo will only cross with other squash belonging to the sea pepo species, so it won't cross with any maxima or gyrosperma or machata. Um, there is a there's a lot of debate about this. Um, one of the one of the schools of thought is that of the four species, crossing can occur between C. argyrosperma and C. moshata, um, but only when C. argyrosperma is the female and C. moshata is the male. Um, therefore, um, you know, you could safely grow one pepo, one maxima, and either moshata or argyrosperma safely without having to worry about cross-contamination. Um, just in terms of um, vocabulary, it's also interesting to note that the term pumpkin doesn't refer to a single species. The term is simply applied to any fruit that resembles what we think of as uh, pumpkin-like, um, you know, big and orange or small and orange. Um, and additionally, some cucurbita species and varieties are classified as gourds um, and will cross or have the potential to cross with the other varieties that you're growing in your garden. Um, saving seeds of varieties that you love can help safeguard those varieties against extinction. Um, this graph illustrates the diverse availability of varieties available in 1903 through commercial seed houses. 80 years later, which you can see on the graph at the bottom of the screen, many of these varieties have disappeared. Um, in 1903, for example, 341 different squash varieties were offered. Today, only 40 of those varieties can be found in the National Center for Genetic Resource Preservation, which is the USDA's gene bank, where we back up our own collection. Um, so now we're ready to discuss the meat of hand pollination. Um, hand pollination commences once female flowers begin to be produced by the squash plants, which for our time frame that we talked about earlier, um, is generally around week 26, week 27 in Northeast Iowa. Um, in most varieties, a surge of male flowers will proceed or precede any female flower formation by one to two weeks. Um, but once males begin showing up, the need for a tentative scouting of the plants becomes really crucial. Hand pollination should not take place on rainy days or days of excessive moisture. Um, so either before you begin to see that initial surge of males or even earlier in the season, you'll want to compile your list of needed materials. Um, this is what we use, so you shouldn't feel constricted by this list. If you find things that work for you, um, that's great. Incorporate them. Um, you know, this should be a platform for your own creativity in your garden, doing, doing your own hand pollinations. Um, a lot of what I'm going to talk about is pretty specific for what we do at Seed Savers. Um, so I, I feel that there's a lot of wiggle room for you to take that information and really make it your own in your garden. Um, you, you will need the following items, um, colored flagging tape, wide masking tape. We use a two inch wide tape, permanent markers, marking flags, a hand sanitizer, which can either be one of the store-bought pump squirty things, um, or, you know, if you rather do like an alcohol solution, um, that's fine too. The main purpose of the hand sanitizer um, is to sanitize the, and kind of dissolve, uh, render the pollen less viable as you go from variety to variety. Um, it also carries the purpose of uh, lessening the transmission via your hands of viruses from variety to variety as well. Um, you'll also want an apron or a bucket of supplies to help you carry all of your uh, effects around 
and then an all weather journal or spreadsheet for keeping track of the pollinations that you do. Um, I find that that the spreadsheet we have is very helpful for looking at trends in the field um, and lets me look back at weather patterns and figure out you know potentially why my pollinations didn't take um, you know if it was overcast and really muggy you know there's a good chance that a lot of the females that they are going to abort um, so that's that's what we do um, you should keep as much information as you feel necessary um, for your own purposes um, so as I mentioned, hand sanitizer is a must, um, regardless of your personal preferences. Um, it's, it's pretty crucial in preventing the transmission of pollen um, and the transmission of viruses and fungal contaminants from variety to variety. Um, so step one is scouting, which involves looking for males and females. Um, here at Seed Savers, this takes place Monday through Thursday at 2.30 p.m., and it generally takes us two hours to do our patch. Um, so you'll definitely need to modify this time for, for your situation. Um, later in the day is, is definitely more ideal. Um, it, it kind of allows the flowers to really, really exhibit their ripeness before you start looking for them. Um, you know, but you need to get comfortable with the varieties that you're working with as well. Um, sometimes varieties will ripen really quickly and really early in the day. And so you might have to, you might have to adjust your scouting times based on the varieties that you're dealing with and observations that you're making while you're in your garden or in the field with the plants. Um, so step one in this process is identifying the females that are ready to be pollinated. Female flowers can be readily identified by the ovary that's located between the flower and the stem. Um, the ovary will resemble, resemble a small squash. The size, shape, and color will vary from variety to variety. And once a variety begins producing females, um, what we do here is we hang a really bright length of flagging tape from our field pole, just to indicate to us that the variety is ready for hand pollination to begin. Um, for your purposes at home, this may not be necessary. Um, but I'm, I'm quite a visual person and with the number of varieties we do, uh, it's a necessary step for us. Um, tying, at the, tying the female at the appropriate stage is crucial to the success of the pollinations. The flower needs to be plump and puffy. Uh, it needs to be soft when you squeeze it and a peachy orange color at the tips. Um, each variety will, will display these characteristics in a slightly different manner but all females of the varieties I've worked with do exhibit these signs when they're ready. Um, you can see in this photo that the flowers on these females are blushing a yellow peach, um, and the flower on the right is actually just starting to separate at the tip ever so slightly. Um, these are females that would be ready, they would be open tomorrow morning if they were still on the plant. Um, so these are, these are really good signs to look for as you're going through um, and looking at the, you know, the arms and the tendrils that your squash are putting out. Um, another, another good identifying feature of the females is that they're going to be tucked really close into, um, you know, I, I want to call it the armpit, um, but the armpit of the, the stem that they're on. Um, whereas the males are going to be really visual. They're going to be up in the canopy, kind of hovering over um, where the leaves are so that the bees can really easily find them. The females are going to be more hidden and tucked into that plant. Um, as, a, as a general rule, absolutely do not tie any flowers that have already opened up. Um, they're, they're already contaminated and won't be any good for the purposes of hand pollination. Um, so here we found a female that's ready to be tied. Uh, the flowers begun flushing that lovely color and is softening up. Um, so using a brightly colored piece of flagging tape, I like to make a loop before sliding the knot over the tip of the flower. Um, the flagging tape doesn't need to go down the flower very far, far enough so that when the flower puffs up in the morning, the corners of the flower won't puff out and create holes that insects can get in, but not so far down the flower that the stigma is bruised by the tie. Um, so you can see here, this is another picture of that flower tied. 
we flag all the males and females that we find in order to make retrieval the next morning more efficient. Um, you may or may not want to do this depending on how big your patch is. Um, we also pluck off females that have already opened up um, and toss them into the chum bucket, which then goes into the compost. Um, if you're going to squash to eat, um, you know, you may want to leave the OP fruit on the vine so that you get a tasty meal. Um, but we find that with the number of fruit that is our ideal harvest, um, in order to, to make sure that we get enough, we need to pluck off the ones that are open pollinated. Um, we plant 36 plants of each variety in order to ensure that we get a minimum of 18 fruit per variety. Um, as a home seed saver, one to two fruit will probably yield more than sufficient supply for you and your extended family and your friends, <laughs> or enough for you to take to a seed swap. Um, I asked Grant to take this picture to show kind of a vast array of ripeness seen within the flower development. Um, the left side of your screen um, shows flowers that are still pretty green and undeveloped. Um, progressing to the, to the far right side where we have a male and female flowers that have already opened and are, are considered contaminated. Um, the bottom row shows an array of female flowers with the second and third females as the ones I would consider for the next day's pollinations. Um, I hope that you are able to see the distinction between the second and the third versus kind of that, um, that first one outside of the box and to see just a little bit of visual difference between the flower. Um, within that little box on the lower left side of the female flower row are some precautionary fruit. Flowers and fruits that are yellowing, um, like that little wrinkly guy just to the left of the other healthy looking female, um, are generally a sign of abortion. Um, don't tie these flowers closed. You know, they're only going to fall off anyway, and it's, it's just kind of a waste of your time. Um, there's, there's several reasons why plants will start aborting their fruit. Um, you know, it could be related to heat stress or pest pressure. Um, sometimes they have enough fruit on the vine already that it really can't sustain um, supporting any more, any more life. Uh, so it just aborts the fruit that it's already put out. Um, the the ones that are little like that, they're usually quite sensitive to pressure and get knocked off the vine pretty easily. So the aborter that's pictured here is pretty far along in the process. Um, the earlier stages often mimic what you see. So the ovary will start to turn a yellow color and the flower will kind of start to get this really sickly yellow peach. Um, and here's where you need to be really careful because that, that yellow peach flower is what's going to make your brain say, oh, it's a female to tie when it's really not. Um, you know, so the flower will be soft to the touch, um, like I was telling you to look for earlier. But the difference, the big difference is that when a healthy female flower is squeezed, you'll get a spring and a bounce. So the flower will kind of retain its shape and bounce back with a gentle squeeze. Whereas with an aborting flower, the flower will stay in the shape that you just pressed it and won't, won't like won't bounce back to its original shape. Um, I included the other female to the far left just to show the kinds of abnormalities that can be observed in the patch, again due to different stresses that your plants are experiencing. Um, and um, you know, other, other signs of stress are that your plant might start producing um, some hermaphroditic males where the males, uh, the male flowers have both sexual organs. Um, and again, that's a, that's a stress response. Um, it's best if you can identify those so that you don't use them for either male or female parts of the pollination. Um, so step two, once you found your females, step two is going through and finding and taping three males for every female flower found. So for example, you know, if you found three females, you would need to tape nine males. Um, ideally, these would be from different plants of the same variety, but if you only grew one plant, there is no harm in selfing. Um, and selfing is taking the males from the plant that the female is on and using 
um, kind of using the same. So instead of getting different ones, you're using all from the same plant. So again, we're back at this picture. The top row are the male flowers. Um, the fourth and fifth males would be considered ready for pollination the next day. The last male in that row has already opened um, and curled back up. So don't be fooled by him. To the touch, the flower will be soft, but when you squeeze it, it's not gonna maintain its shape. Um, it's, gonna, it's gonna stay in that convoluted twist. Um, so just be wary, be wary of him and don't use that flower. Uh, here's a closer look at the males that are ready to be taped. The male flowers should be exhibiting similar traits as the female flowers. Um, they should be puffy and plump. They should have that orangey yellow flesh at the tips of the flowers, and they should be really soft when squeezed, but they shouldn't be open. Um, again, don't tape any flowers that have already opened. Uh, and once the total number of males has been determined for a variety, um, begin taping and flagging. Um, here's a male that we found that is, that is very ready, um, and a two inch piece of masking tape was applied to the flower to keep it closed until we're ready to expose it in the morning. The flowers are pretty easy to tape. Um, you simply just need to tear off a piece of tape about four inches long, um, put half of it under the flower, making sure the tip of the flower is slightly below the top of the tape and fold the piece of tape over so that you're sandwiching the flower in the middle. Um, give it a good press on the seams so that you stick everything together really, really well. All the sides need to be completely sealed, um, being careful that you don't damage your flower. Um, so effectively, you're closing all entry points. Um, then we flag, we flag the flower and continue going until we found the number of males necessary. Um, in order for us to remember which varieties we need to visit in the morning, we write down the pertinent information, which for us is the number of females and the number of males that we're looking for on yet another piece of flagging tape and hang it from the field pole. Um, so now you're done with the scouting process for that variety um, and in the morning we'll be able to do your pollinations. Um, so step three. Pollinations need to take place in the morning, um, and this is when the bees are also out and about. Um, it, it tends to be the time when the flowers are most receptive. We begin our pollinations when all the dew is dried, uh, so that we're not transmitting fungal spores between plants. It's a fairly good practice that I would recommend um, you to take up and to consider um, doing in your own garden. It can, it can make a world of difference. Um, so for us, this is generally at 9 a.m., but if, if, you know, it may be different where you are, kind of depending on your, you know, location, altitude, humidity, whatnot. Um, so before actually doing the pollinations, you'll want to gather all the males for the variety that you were working with and set three males down by each female. When you're going through and plucking off the males, be sure to leave a length of stem on them. You know, I would say at least a good five to six inches. Um, this is gonna act as the handle to your paintbrush and allow you to be a more efficient pollinator. So here's our female from the afternoon before. Um, you can see that she puffed out and has created a little star above where she was uh, flagged. Um, that's a really, really good sign. It's a sign that, that you know, we called this one right. She's ready for pollination. Um, and so as long as we have males that we got at the right time as well, this should be a pretty, a pretty good pollination. Um, so having your chum bucket and a piece of masking tape ready, you'll need to tear off the top portion of the female just below where it was tied and toss that into the chum bucket. So here's just a picture. You can see that we're not you know, we haven't exposed the stigma inside. Um, there's enough of the flower left that, that it's just kind of a protective little cone. Briefly inspect the flower for insect intruders. Um, it is not uncommon <laughs> to open up, you know, to look in your female flower and see ants in there or to find cucumber beetles that chewed their way in. Um, if there are signs of insect damage or activity, that female needs to be either removed from the plant um, or just left as an OP variety for your dinner table. 
Um, if there are no signs of insects, uh, devote an eye to watching the opening of the flower to make sure that no bees or any other insects go inside. Um, you know, if you're not comfortable just leaving your eye on the flower, you can always put your hand over it and just cup it so that it's, it acts more like a physical barrier. Um, so while, while you're watching the female flower, begin removing the petals and sepals of the male. Um, this is done by holding the part of the flower where the petal meets the hard, waxy bottom. Um, so that, that base, just where the sepals attach um, to, the, to the stem, um, and tearing the petals away from this portion of the flower with an upward clockwise motion. Um, it might take you a bit of practice to get that down in one fell swoop. Um, you know, so tape a couple extra males and give it a try. Um, you definitely want to make sure to get all of the sepals off because those are really going to impede. Um, you know, when you go to put the male in the female and if the sepals are still present, it's going to be really challenging, you know, for you to not harm um, the external features of the female flower. So do the best that you can in removing those. The exposed stamen should be dripping with bright yellow fluffy pollen. Um, you know, that's the best sign and that's exactly what you want to see, um, you know, is thousands of little pollen grains. So once you've got that exposed, carefully rub the stamen over the pistil um, in the female flower, transferring as much pollen as possible, and then repeat this with the remaining males. Um, when the three males have been used, uh, you'll need to tape the female blossom closed um, and, and label it. You know, you don't want to put all this work into a fruit that, you know, that you think you'll remember and then, and then don't. Um, that would be just a really heartbreaking thing. <laughs> um, so tape the flower closed with another piece of masking tape. Um, you'll tape it in the same exact manner in which the males were taped. Um, but you'll need to use a bit more of a delicate touch. Um, at this point, you know, you don't want to press too hard. You don't want to twist the flower. Um, some varieties, some of the flowers are definitely more fragile than others. We have a, a very large southern variety going in our squash patch right now. And it's got these huge, beautiful torpedo shaped fruit. You know, and the fruit have these huge, beautiful blossoms, and they are the most sensitive things that we've dealt with, um, you know, since I've since I've been here. Um, and it's just incredible how delicate, you know, how, just how sensitive and delicate we need to be with those flowers. Um, you know, and these are things that you'll learn as you go through the process and as you learn about the varieties that you're growing and and their their intricacies. Um, so be sure when you're taping the female to seal the tape tightly. It's the same concept as the male flower. You really want to make sure, even at this point, that no one is able to get in there. Um, and then loosely tie a piece of flagging tape around the stem of the female you just pollinated. You know, I've, I've seen people use yarn. Um, you know, there's a whole host of things. You could probably write on it with a Sharpie marker. Um, I don't know. I think that that would probably last. Um, you know, create your own your own system so that it's a visual identifier for you. Um, we include information that's important to us, which are, you know, we identify everything by plant type and plant type numbers, and then everything has a unique grow out ID. Uh, we also include the date of pollination and the initials of the pollinator. Um, but, you know, you might just want something that's as simple as um, yeah, just a piece of flagging tape around it that, that is a color that identifies and has meaning to you. So here's our finished product. Um, remember to sanitize your hands if you're moving on to another variety. If you're moving on to a, you know, another female of the same variety, you know, it's definitely up to you whether you sanitize your hands between each fruit. Um, but it's, it's not as necessary. So the task of hand pollination doesn't end at pollination. Um, continual monitoring of your fruit and the health of your plants is really critical to make sure that your fruit actually reaches mature maturity. Um, you know, things that can 
really impact the success of your plants and of your fruit are you know high degrees of insect pressure um, they can spread diseases and and viral pathogens so quickly um, that your plants will die prematurely and and really affect your harvest um, you know it's it doesn't just stop you know your gardeners it doesn't just stop when you have a fruit set that that gardening and that maintaining a homo homeostasis in in your environment um, needs to happen throughout the entire season um, so harvesting processing and storing seeds um, two factors will determine the harvest time of squash these are a color change and a hardening of the skin um, we'll, we'll really briefly discuss harvesting, processing, um, and, and super basic seed storage, just to kind of take this process from seed to seed. Um, in some varieties, you'll notice a really significant color change, you know, from, from dark green to bright orange, or from a really muted kind of unsuspecting green to yellow. Um, it's, it's a really beautiful change to watch. Um, and this change is going to be followed by the hardening of the skin coat and the skin will actually get so hard that you won't be able to dent it with your fingernail. Um, in other varieties, you know, the color change is pretty subtle. They can go from a light green to a really, really dark green. Um, and so maturity is more marked by the hardening of the skin coat. With summer squash, harvest time is really important. Uh, fruit can generally remain on the plant until the plant starts to decline or, or you know, or it completely succumbs to death. Um, you want to get it at the initial stages of that decline. So once harvested, your fruit should be processed within a month. <coughs> Pardon me. Um, summer squash don't hold as well as winter squash. Um, that's probably not a big surprise for anyone. Um, Winter squash will hold much longer, both in the field and off the vine, than the summer varieties. All winter varieties can be left on the vine for as long as possible. Um, there are a few factors that hasten the harvesting process. Um, again, those are if a variety is succumbing to disease pressure, uh, if you're getting an impending frost, like a really hard frost, um, or if there's severe deer damage being observed. Um, those are variety, or those are reasons that you would want to bring a fruit in early. Um, otherwise, you know, bring it in when you start seeing the plants declining and when you notice that the fruit are at their ideal maturity. Um, fruit can be stored and monitored for months of the winter squash. Um, you know that you're, you're going to want that to be in a pretty cool environment. Uh, the warmer you're, you know, the warmer the area that you're holding these fruit, the, the more active any kind of bacteria or fungus that's living on the skin is going to be. And so you're going to see a decline of the fruit more rapidly um, in, in warmer environments than you are if you keep it a little bit cooler. Uh, it's just like root cellaring. Um, so, it, so once you begin to see those signs of decline on the outside of the fruit, they should be processed immediately. Um, and if you do plan on holding your winter squash for an extended duration of time, um, you might want to cut one open, you know, every couple of weeks and just make sure that everything is okay inside um, so that you're not holding on to something that has completely liquefied um, and isn't showing the signs of it. Um, so that should be included as well in your monitoring process. Um, processing a summer squash can be a bit of a challenge. Uh, the rind gets harder than you will be able to believe. <laughs> um, we, we have a, a really simple machine that we call the squasher, and it's basically like a, a wooden guillotine um, that crushes our fruit in half, and, and it has probably saved my legs and my fingers from, you know, impending disaster many times. Um, Otherwise, a good sharp kitchen knife will work. It's going to take, you know, it's going to take a bit of elbow grease to actually get it in some of your summer squash, um, you know, and if you find other methods that work, uh, that's fantastic. Last year we used a machete 
<laughs> and, a, and a rubber mallet. Um, and, and that was a pretty good method as well. Um, you know, so be creative, <laughs> come up with solutions that are fun. Um, so with squash, um, I know that, um, you know, if you do save seed from any other of the, what I call fleshy fruited, um, plant types, you know, tomatoes or melon or eggplant, uh, there's a very specific way that you want to cut the fruit in order to aid in seed extraction. Um, it's really, it's really a matter of personal preference with squash. There is no one way that makes it easier than any other way. Um, you can either cut it across the equator um, or from pole to pole. And I hope that those, that those uh, make sense as you're looking at this picture of squash. Um, but either way works just fine. And once you've opened the fruit, uh, the only thing you need to do is extract the seed from the placenta and toss it into a bowl. Um, you know, if any of you have ever taken seed, um, you know, out of a squash that you want to roast, it's the same principle. Um, and even taking seeds out of a pumpkin that you're going to carve, it's, it's incredibly similar. Um, you know, and it's probably something that most of us did and, and never thought about. Um, so once you, once you have those seeds extracted, let them sit in water overnight. What that's going to do is that's going to, it's going to really increase the enzyme activity and it's going to break down the sugars that are surrounding the seed coat. Um, a lot of the fleshy fruited plant types have enzyme inhibitors that are, that are located directly around the, the seed. Um, and so that fermentation process helps break that down as well. And it, it really just mimics you know, the process that would happen naturally if that fruit were allowed to sit in the field and go through its entire process of, you know, ripe decline, you know, complete rot. And then those seeds would overwinter in that spot and germinate the next year. Um, so once you've let it sit overnight, you're going to want to wash the seeds with a heavy stream of water the next day, either by putting them in a colander um, or a sieve or something, you know, very similar with holes. Um, lay that seed after you're done washing it on an old window screen or in a colander with a fan on it to dry for several days. While they're drying, um, it's really important that they have that airflow. Um, that's what's going to speed that drying process so that your seeds don't mold. Um, and as they're sitting in front of the fan, you're also going to want to stir them. And, you know, I would say if you can stir them twice a day, that's fantastic. Um, if you can only stir them once a day, you're not, that's going to be way okay as well. Um, so don't, don't stress, definitely don't stress over the amount of time that you're able to stir your seeds. Um, so once they're dry, once they're thoroughly dry to the touch and you're able to break a seed in half, um, it's, it's dry to the point that you can put it into storage. Um, for home storage, you know, I would recommend putting it in, um, you know, in a sealed mason jar and then just sticking it in, um, you know, in a, a shelf or a drawer of your fridge. And that should maintain a good enough temperature that you can pull it out next year and everything will be ready um, for you to start the process all over again. Thank you all very much for joining this workshop and I hope that you got some valuable information from it. <laughs>